I'm sure a lot of you guys know that one of the most devastating events to happen in America was 9-11, in which on September 11th of 2001, terrorists hijacked and crashed two commercial airplanes into both of the World Trade Centers, causing its complete collapse. And this resulted in the deaths of 2,977 people, with an additional 25,000 injured and over $10 billion worth of property damage. According to the congressional records, this was called the single deadliest terrorist attack in human history. And the reason why this event was so shocking was not just because of all these people who died in this incident, but just because of the fact that it happened to something like this monument. The World Trade Center was often considered an icon of New York City. It played a major role in pop culture, and some saw this tower as representing the pride and strength of America. And in one quick move, a long historical legacy was torn down. And this event was so shocking and so impactful that it even had major effects on the nation days and weeks afterwards. The stock market didn't open until six days later, at which time it crashed pretty big. About $2.8 billion in job wages were lost in the first few months. Air travel was closed off for a few days after 9-11, and even after opening, travel sales were down 20%. And the days following 9-11, many events were canceled, as well as closing of schools and evacuations for fear of further terrorist attacks. There was just this sense of gloominess that was all around society, and it was just so like joyless now all of a sudden to attend concerts and go to work and go to school and to attend all these other festive events. But yet, interestingly, during this time, there was actually a short increase, a short-term increase, I would say, in church attendance as people were there to seek God or to seek answers to the questions of pain and suffering in life. And luckily, some people actually did come to know Jesus as a result. And I know because I've talked to one of those people in the past. Now, I'm not going to go so far as to say that this act was a divine act of judgment against the United States of America. But what we can get from this incident by looking at it is this. There is nothing so great that mankind can build that cannot be torn down in an instance. And 9-11 is really an example of that. Throughout history, people have built cities, religious entities, businesses, political kingdoms, all for pride and glory. And many thought that it was invincible and couldn't be torn down or stopped. And yet nothing is bigger than the future Babylon city that is going to come onto the scene during the seven-year tribulation period. A city that is so big and luxurious and so proud, but yet it exports all the grossest sins to the entire world, and it is an example of depravity. With such a great empire, who can tear down this city? How can believers really stand a chance to overcome this? Well, we can't, but the Lord God can. And he promises that in the end, it's all going to be torn down as an act of judgment. And this is going to impact the world greatly. And they're going to see that the Lord God is holy and righteous and that we must fear him. So today, like I said, we are going to be continuing in the book of Revelation. We are getting pretty close to the climax right now. Revelation speaks about the end of the world. It speaks about the redemption of Israel. It speaks about avenging, you know, on behalf of the church. And it also speaks about judgment that comes upon an unbelieving world because of their sin and unrepentance. So in last week's passage, in chapter 17, we saw this great harlot who represented this spiritual religious entity that comes onto the scene that was supported by the Antichrist. And it causes the whole world to stumble into idolatry, seeking after her instead of after the Lord God. And God is saying, no, that is not good. 
In fact, the Lord was so angry with this that he judged this harlot and brought her down. Interestingly, through the Antichrist himself. And now in today's passage, we see the continuation of the Babylon story in which we see a counterpart. We see a headquarter, which is a city, this huge Babylon city that comes onto the world at the time, which was also an example of depravity, stumbling the world into sin. And God also promises in this passage that this too shall be torn down. And this is a sobering lesson to us to fear God, to repent and to seek after him while we still can. So in today's passage, three prophetic pictures are given to us surrounding the fate of Babylon, which shows us the certainty and the impact of God's coming judgment upon the world. So the certainty and the impact of God's judgment begins with, number one, the swiftness of Babylon's demise. Demise means death. The swiftness, how fast this thing is going to be destroyed. And we see that in the first eight verses. So if you have your Bibles, please open up to chapter 18. If you're there already, God bless you guys. We are going to be looking at the first eight verses together to see the rise and the fall of Babylon City. Beginning in verse 1, John says, After these things... I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons, and a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. All right, so let's see what's going on here. It says that there was an angel who came down from heaven who had the authority of God. And remember, by this time, the earth has been darkened by the fifth bowl judgment. So this angel comes as this bright light in this whole dark world. And as part of the seventh bowl judgment, which comes, Babylon is going to be taken down as well. And this angel affirms it. He says, fallen, fallen is Babylon. To show that this thing is about to be destroyed by the Lord God. So why is Babylon fallen? Why is the Lord picking on this Babylonian city when there's so many other cities in the world that God could have destroyed, if any? Well, one reason the texts tell us is that it is the place where demons live. All these unclean spirits. Now, if you remember earlier in Revelation, we saw that around that area is where the demons were released. They all came out upon the world and terrorized the entire world. So Babylon is a pretty demonic place. I mean, I guess even if you were to travel to Iraq right now, you know, I've actually heard stories of people who say that they felt something really dark around that Babylon area, especially during the Iraqi war. But yeah, there are a lot of demons there, and these demons are infesting this Babylon city, which is why it does so much evil. But then there's also another reason why Babylon's going to be judged. Because this city has caused all the powerful and all the common people to stumble into sin. And really, what kind of city is this? It's a bad city. And you know, the Lord, he is very displeased with cities like this. Cities that cause people to fall into idol worship, to fall into materialism, to fall into greed, to fall into prostitution and human trafficking. It says that it enslaved kings and merchants, which shows how prosperous the city was. So this city became pretty big. Now, if you were to travel right now to Iraq, this Babylon location is kind of near the city of Baghdad. So right now, there's really you know, nothing so big there right now. But some scholars theorize that you know, there could possibly be a big Babylonian city there in development into the future. And we see that here as well. That it is a huge city full of luxury, full of entertainment, full of all the best food, full of all these things that are imported into the city. 
It's kind of like a red lights district. You know the best way that I can describe what the city is like? Probably it's like a modern day Las Vegas. Just my, my hunch. So Vegas, as you know, started out as a small town in the middle of a desert, like in the middle of nowhere. I don't know if you guys have been to Las Vegas before. You notice how like Las Vegas, when you're in there, it seems like, wow, there's so much going on in there. But then once you travel outside of Vegas, you just see like how much desert and barrenness is all around, right? And much the same way, that's exactly what Babylon is like. So, you know, like with Las Vegas, what I think is really interesting is that as years and years have gone by, I've seen it personally growing up as a kid whenever I would travel in with my family. This thing would get bigger and bigger and more luxurious and more luxurious year after year after year. More casinos being built, state-of-the-art architecture, the best five-star dining experiences, all these entertainment shows. It has even been called the entertainment capital of the world and has some of the best hotel casinos in the world, having more than more triple A five diamonds hotels than any other city in the world. And I think you guys would know that if you were to go to Vegas. But yet, there's a reason why Las Vegas is called Sin City. Because it has a reputation of legalized prostitution there. But many other sins come out of it, including like easy marriage and easy divorce and drugs and gambling and organized crime. So it's really a city where pleasures and materialism just thrives like no other. And God tells us, you know, even though you live in the city, it's important that you don't become entangled in the culture and the worldliness of that city. That is the main lesson he gives us even for today. But yet in the future, unlike Las Vegas, God is going to destroy this particular city. So I'm not saying God is, will not destroy Vegas. Who knows? Maybe he will. But this city we know for sure he is going to destroy. That's why God warns through another angel in verse 4. He says, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues, for her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquity. So like I said, this city is known for so many disgusting gross sins. From fornication, to idol worship, to drugs, you name it, but it all has consequences. God's saying that the sins in the city is so bad that it piled up to the heavens which pretty much is a reference to the Tower of Babel, that this thing actually reached heaven. That's how high their sins were. And God is saying to them, get out of there. Just like I told Lot when he was living in Sodom and Gomorrah, I am going to destroy the city right now, so flee from the city while you still can. So you guys, I hope you're seeing this as a message of you know, don't just see this as a message of God is going to, you know, destroy the city in the future. Oh, well. God is telling us an important lesson about compromising with worldliness. It's something we just cannot do. Babylon is an example of that. But even right now, we have a lot of situations that are very similar. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Don't just see Paul's command as a command for marriage, but he talks about any sort of alliances with unbelievers that would endanger your spiritual health. So be very careful. Because the angel promises, God told through this angel, this thing is going to come down. Verse 6 says, Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her, to the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning, for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow, and will never see mourning. So the Lord is saying, to the same degree that she has caused all these people to sin and do evil, 
pay her back. Give her exactly what she deserves. So these are the reasons why Babylon is being punished. Because according to verse 7, it says that she exalted herself. She wanted all the worship. She wanted all the attention that rightly belongs to God. And then secondly, she lived sensuously, which means that she lived for pleasure. She sinned to her heart's desire. And then the third reason why, because she was self-sufficient. She thought she was a queen. She says, I don't have need for repentance. I don't see my need for righteousness. I don't see my need for God. But unfortunately, this leads to her downfall. So in many ways, you can say this is a picture of humanity as well. Think of us as well. I mean, look at the spirit of Babylon that's even in our hearts. The spirit of exalting ourselves in pride, living sensuously for all the sinful pleasures, as well as, you know, being self-righteous and just being self-sufficient, saying, I don't need, you know, God. I'm good. I'm the king. I'm good. I can get to heaven. Those people who think that way, just like Babylon, their destruction is going to come swiftly. It says, in one day her plagues will come. Pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. This city thought it was strong. It thought that nothing could touch it. But yet the Lord God is even stronger. And then in one instance, this whole thing comes crashing down. This whole city is set on fire. We don't know exactly how it happens. It doesn't tell us specifically. But God does something in order to destroy the city. And it burns down to the ground. So this shows God is somebody you cannot mess with. Really at all. The lesson behind point number one, it's very clear. It's very simple, guys. Any economic or spiritual entity or kingdom that exalts itself, misuses its resources, promotes sin, persecutes God's people, will face wrath and destruction. So God is telling us, don't go on the losing side. Don't participate and live for worldliness. Instead, get out of it. Persevere in doing what's right. Even though it seems so nice and so glamorous, on this side, don't be peer pressured to follow that. Stick with the Lord God. Now, I also want to ask you guys, because we know that God is going to judge these things and bring it down. But when he does, what is your reaction going to be when he does that? Is it going to cause you to rejoice? Or is it going to cause you to mourn when those things are torn down in due time? And that's exactly what we see in the second point we're going to look at today. The certainty and the impact of God's judgment is seen next in the reactions to Babylon's demise. Because when Babylon goes down, it causes a reaction amongst people and it tells us something. So continuing on in verse 9, look at what happens after this city is destroyed. It says, And the kings of the earth... <clears throat> who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her, will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. So these kings of the earth, when they see the city destroyed, do they repent? Do they come to their senses? Do they say, oh, this is a great thing that Babylon has been destroyed. All the sin has been removed right now. No. Instead, they mourn. And don't think they're mourning because, you know, they're just a bunch of dead people there and they just feel sorry for them. They're mourning because their source of sin and income and glorification has been taken away from them. And it begins with these ten rulers who are under the Antichrist. It says in verse 10, they were standing at a distance because obviously they didn't want to get too close because they would, they would get hurt if they get too close to the destruction. So they were at a distance and they said, whoa, whoa. 
and they see this act of judgment that comes upon the city. But then there's also another group that mourns too. Look at this group. This one is actually a very interesting group. In verse 11, John says, The merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. So these merchants were also evil because they participated in fueling the life of Babylon by bringing their merchandise into this city to make it into this sinful paradise. They're also going to cry. They're going to mourn because when the city is destroyed, their business, they got nothing to sell to the city anymore. I mean, they got it, but it's just they, the city can't buy it anymore because it has been destroyed. So they see it as lost income. And they have a lot of stuff in their warehouse. Look at this. According to verse 12, 28 different kinds of merchandise on sale for Babylon. Gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, and every kind of ivory, and every article made from very costly wood, and bronze, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and spice, and incense, and perfume, and frankincense, and wine, and olive oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and cattle, and sheep, and cargoes of horses, and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. Woo! Imagine trying to memorize that as part of your VBS thing, huh? That would be kind of fun. All of these ancient commodities, but in the future, they will also be sold as well. All the best stuff in the world. All the luxurious stuff that was imported in order to make Babylon a fat, rich, indulgent city. But yet this business was so evil because according to verse, according to this verse in verse 13, it says here that there were also slaves in human lives. Think about that. In the future, slave trading is going to be pretty big. Probably even a prostitution ring as well. Even people have become commodities to be traded. How sad. That is why the Lord God brings it down. But then these merchants, they don't feel sorry for these people. Instead, they mourn because their business has been destroyed. According to verse 14, it says, The fruit you long for has gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and men will no longer find them. So basically, merchandise is gone, luxury is gone, party is over. But then look at how it continually stresses the mourning of these merchants. According to verse 15, it says, The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, she who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste. And every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what, they were just saying this, what city is like the great city? Oh man, there's just like so much going on here if you see this. Like I said, they were weeping because they saw just their prophets and their source of sin being completely taken away. That's really the main point of what it's trying to say. All these kings and merchants and sailors and everything like that. But just think of even the situation today. For example, what if the abortion industry were to be shut down? What would the reaction of the public be? Now, you would think as a Christian, the reaction would be, oh, that's such a great thing because all these babies are going to be saved and, you know, praise the Lord. But you know, not everybody thinks that way. 
We know because that's part of our sinfulness. There are actually people out there who've actually been outraged and even wept over the possibility of Planned Parenthood being defunded. And this happened a few years ago, actually. And what was the re reaction? It caused grief amongst unbelievers. It caused them to really be upset over it. Because Planned Parenthood, they make a lot of money. According to their report, this is their report that came out in 2013. Planned Parenthood reports an average annual revenue of $1.3 billion. 530 million of it which comes from government funding. Yikes. It's a big industry. It's big business. So if this thing were to get defunded or if it were to be completely wiped out, whether by the U.S. government or as an act of judgment from the Lord God himself, you know what? These people are not going to mourn. They see it as lost income. They see it as lost jobs. They see it as a loss of freedom to decide whether they want to keep their kid or not. That's the way they see these things because they're so much in love with their sin that they just cannot see it any differently. Now, I want you to think about, not just like with abortion industry, but also think about other things as well. What if the pornography industry were to be completely taken down? What if the gambling industry were to be removed completely? What if the drug industry were to be shut down completely? What about if in movies and music and television, we were to take out all blasphemy and all sex scenes and all extreme violence? What if all that was taken down? And uh, the question is, when, if it were, and it will be in the future, what is your reaction going to be when this happens? Are you going to rejoice because righteousness has prevailed? Or is there going to be a big part of you that's going to mourn when that happens? And this is a serious question, guys. I'm throwing this out because depending on what your answer is, will most likely reveal where your heart is at in your relationship with the Lord. Because if you look at these things, and for some reason, your heart is so attached to worldliness that you would mourn if a big part of that was torn down because that was a major part of your identity as a person. And if you're claiming to be a Christian then you need to examine your faith to see if you are truly in the faith. Because if you are a child of God and you're filled by the Holy Spirit, if you say you're saved and going to heaven, then God is doing this work to transform you and to make you more like Christ. And if instead you're going the other direction and you mourn for the destruction of those things and you're so in love with the world, then you need to see if you're truly in the faith or not. Use this day to examine yourself so that you can get right with God while you still can. Because the Lord God says that on Judgment Day, many will come to Him and they'll say, Lord, Lord, but God will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me forever. You don't want to hear those things from God. And that is the reason why these people are mourning because they are lost. And they love their sin so, so much. Look at how much they were mourning. According to verse 19, they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. They were grieving so much and they saw that the city that's been torn down led to just losing everything in life. What purpose do they have to live for anymore? But as a church, when we look at this, in many ways, it should be a reason for us to rejoice that these evil entities will be taken down by the Lord God. That is why in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Paul says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And when the Lord God does repay, 
Heaven is saying, you have every reason, brothers and sisters, to rejoice right now. And that is what we see in verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment against her. So the Lord is saying, your time of justice is being brought. I have avenged you. So when this city falls, God is saying to the saints, rejoice, because this is the answer to your prayer right now. You have prayed so much for justice because of all this persecution and all this worldliness that you, you just had to put up with for so long. Rejoice right now, because now is the time where it all comes down. So the lesson behind point number two is really simple. All of these things before God, it's not going to stand. But then when it does come down, like I said once again, what is your reaction going to be? Are we living in the Lord God and rejoicing in righteousness and hanging on? Or are we living in worldliness And just really dreading the idea that one day it could all come to an end. Because this could reveal where your heart is with the Lord, which is why you need to take this moment, the next hour, to really reflect on the implications of what this is saying. Because once this thing comes down, it is going to come down permanently. In the future kingdom of God, there's no going to be no compromise between like the ways of God and the ways of the world and we're all just doing one life together. This is going to be God coming and completely taking over with his righteous rule. And that leads to point number three, which is the last one today. The certainty and impact of God's judgment is seen in believers in the final, the finality of Babylon's demise. It is seen in the finality, the permanence of Babylon's demise. And that is verses 21 to 24. So it says, A strong angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. So this giant millstone that falls into the sea, it is pretty much a metaphor for how great Babylon's fall and destruction will be. A really good picture of it. And as I read to you guys earlier in Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 53 to 55, the Babylonian Empire in Jeremiah's time, you know, God had words of destruction and he did eventually bring down that Babylonian Empire. But in many ways, it prefigures the same judgment and the same wrath that God is going to have towards this future Babylon empire as well. So that is why in Jeremiah, in 51, verses 53 to 55, he says, Though Babylon should ascend to the heavens, and though she should fortify her lofty stronghold, from me destroyers will come to her, declares the Lord. For the Lord is going to destroy Babylon, and he will make her loud noise vanish from her, and their waves will roar like man waters. The tumult of their voices sounds forth. And you know the city, the destruction is going to be so, so wide that it's going to completely impact the economy of the world. According to verse 22, It says, And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeteers will not be heard in you any longer. And no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. And the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer. And continuing in verse 23, And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and all who had been slain on the earth. So impactful will Babylon's death be that it will put an end to all activity. So the music in the city is going to stop. 
All the economic activities are going to stop. Nobody, nobody's going to work. Nobody's going to prepare any more food. Nobody's even going to get married anymore. So all festivities, all this bright and happy stuff, it's all going to come to an end. You see, for many years as Christians, we've had so much of a struggle because when we see worldliness and we see all this evil prospering, you know, there's a part of us that really wants to go in to see if we can stop it and if we can really like, you know, pretty much act as God and to, you know, bring that thing to a close. And no doubt some people have done it in history. But, you know, it's really not our place to go in and to, you know, be the ones to bring the sword upon these people or these entities. Rather, God is going to do it. You know, it kind of reminds me of a story that I heard online about these college kids and these teens who were um, throwing this house party that happened last year in New Jersey. There was a homeowner who let 80 kids throw an alcohol party at his house. 69 of the guests were under the age of 18. So I guess you know that this isn't like legal to do whatsoever. <laughs> but then again, who is going to dis dissuade these kids, huh? Even if you were to go in and tell them not to do that and, you know, it's wrong, it's illegal, they're not going to listen. Party away. All this fun and games and loud music and dance until the police show up to the door and they raid the whole party, which is exactly what happened. A few kids ran away while 71 of the party goers were arrested and, of course, the homeowner was in trouble. Yet these events happen all the time. Alcohol, drug parties, you name it. Once the police barges in, party is pretty much over. And you know this world, up until this time, has really been this one huge, illegal, sinful, depraved party before the eyes of a holy God. And of course there's really nothing much we can really do about it because we can't stop the party. But yet in the future, God is going to barge in, especially to Babylon. And when that happens, it's clear, party is over. No more celebrating. No more drunkenness and idolatry and immorality and music and all that stuff. And, and you know, Jesus, he doesn't do this because he's just a party pooper. He's just doing it for no reason, just to, you know, destroy people's fun. He's doing it for two reasons. First of all, just like verse 23 says, because these merchants were these great men of the earth and all the men, nations were deceived by the sorcery of them. So basically Babylon, especially through the merchants, have misled the entire world into sin. But then here's also another reason, and this is something that I keep touching on again and again, because this is a common theme in the Bible. Because Babylon was responsible for the death of the saints during the tribulation. Because if you speak out about the truth, you speak the gospel, Satan is going to stir in the world to persecute and to try to kill believers. And that's exactly what happens with the future Babylon as well. Very simple lesson. It's going to all be destroyed. All this worldliness, empires, everything, God is going to destroy it. And we should have every reason to persevere and to rejoice. So really, what side are you on today? Because the swiftness and the mourning and the finality of Babylon's demise are all meant to show us that God is going to destroy the world's kingdom before he returns. And when he does destroy it, what is going to be your reaction? Because really, there can only be two reactions. Because if you are here today and you look at something like this and you even look at all these other worldly trends out there that's going to be destroyed in due time, do we look at it and do we say, oh, God is just so unfair and you know he himself is evil and he's just so strict. I love these things. You know, I love to go out and I love to party and I love to get drunk and to you know, dress a certain way that just is very inappropriate and I like to just do drugs and, you know, all these things. 
Because if you really identify with that and you really love that kind of stuff, then today God is giving you a message. He's saying, you need to get right with me. That's the whole reason why people are going to face eternity in hell. This destruction of Babylon is God's wrath on display. And it's the same wrath he's going to show to every individual person who dies in their sins. They'll all have to face a holy God. And guilty sinners will end up in the lake of fire forever. They will end up in hell forever as punishment for their sins. For disregarding the Lord, doing whatever they wanted, violating their conscience, rejecting the gospel, going after God's people. But even though God has every reason to separate you forever eternally, there is still hope today and that is the reason why the gospel is good news. Christianity is a message of good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ, which is that even though we were headed to hell, God came in human flesh. He was the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came to this world and He died on the cross on your behalf, taking your sins upon Himself so that you can be forgiven of your sin. Jesus dying on the cross for all of your sins. That is the love of God on display. That's the only reason why we can have any hope is because Jesus took the wrath of God on our behalf so that we don't have to pay for it in hell. And you can be forgiven today if you repent and turn to Him and trust in Jesus for your salvation. When you turn to God, you believe in what Jesus did for you on the cross, you follow Him as Lord, He's going to forgive you of all your sins. So do that today if that's you. If you are in this category of the people who are in Babylon and you are characterized by their ways just like Scripture says, then do it today so that you can experience the love of God and the assurance of salvation forever so that you can know that if you were to die today, you will be with God in heaven. That's a guarantee from Scripture. So I want to encourage all of you guys in the church, persevere because this message is not just a message about future Babylon's destruction because the theme in this message is something that we all see and we can relate to today which is worldliness that's out there that wants to suck us in and cause us to compromise our convictions so that we can live a different way than the Lord God has called us to and God is saying don't be a part of it but rather flee from it because it is going to be taken down in due time. So I want to encourage you brothers and sisters here to continue in the faith. Don't be fooled and deceived by these things that try to draw you into that system of the spirit of the Antichrist, but to continue to remain firm in the faith. That is really what I'm just encouraging you guys here today. Even though it's not going to be popular, even though you're not going to be popular, but in the end... God is going to stand right by you for the choices that you have made. In conclusion, I've heard a, a quote from a Christian named Dave Roper who defined what worldliness is. So if this is something you're struggling with right now, then use this as a good guide so that you can be able to identify worldliness and to be on guard against it. He says, worldliness is the lust of the flesh, which is a passion for sensual satisfaction. The lust of the eyes, which is an inordinate desire for the finer things of life. And the pride of life, which is self-satisfaction in who we are, what we have, and what we have done. Worldliness, then, is a preoccupation with ease and affluence. It elevates creature comfort to the point of idolatry. Large salaries and comfortable lifestyles become necessities of life. Worldliness is reading magazines about people who live hedonistic lives and spend too much money on themselves and wanting to be like them. More importantly, worldliness is simply pride and selfishness in disguises. It's being resentful when someone snubs us or patronizes us or shows off. 
It means smarting under every slight, challenging every word spoken against us, cringing when another is preferred before us. Worldliness is harboring grudges, nursing grievance, wallowing in self-pity. These are the ways in which we are most like the world. So instead, let us not be like these things, but rather be content in Christ and to follow his ways. Let's pray. Right now, as we are thinking about this message, I want you to think about what exactly does this fallen Babylon message mean for your life right now? It is true that this Babylon is not here right now. It hasn't been destroyed yet. It hasn't done its evil work of drawing people to its influence. But think about how the same sense of worldliness is around you. And the question is, how exactly have you related to this worldliness? Because Jesus tells us to be in the world, but not of the world. So right now, are you in the world? And being an ambassador of Jesus to draw people out of darkness into light. Or rather, are you of the world? In which you go to church on Sundays, you tell people you're a Christian. But yet, your heart and your spirit is exactly the same as those who don't know Jesus. Having the same worldview, making the same choices like that of those who don't believe in the gospel. Because if that characterizes your life, then you are, in essence, in the culture of Babylon. And you don't want to go down with it. So today, use this opportunity to make your salvation right with the Lord. Because God is saying, Come to me, though you do deserve judgment, I extend my grace to you today. Jesus says, come to me, turn from your sin, follow after me. Believe that what I did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago is sufficient and enough for your salvation. And you can find peace you can have the hope of eternal life. And I also want to encourage you guys that if you have compromised with worldliness or you're weak in that area because of your flesh, your passions, then use this moment and in this week to reflect upon this and to say to the Lord, give me the strength to overcome so that I don't compromise. For Satan wants to tempt me in this area, but I will not go in that direction. But rather, I will live for Jerusalem, the new one that's coming. Not for Babylon, but rather live for the holy city that's coming. To be a citizen of that city. So Father, we thank you for giving us this gift of salvation. And we pray, Lord, as we continue this journey, that you'll strengthen us so that we can walk holy as you have called us to live. And please, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.